Welcome to the Ovary Project Briefs. I am John McTemus. This is officially brief number 43, being recorded in the year of, we're told, 2023. It is entitled Mandela James Version, and it is being made by way of a viewer suggestion. Now, some of the Obrey Project briefs are spontaneous, some are extemporaneous. This one is a little bit beyond extemporaneous due to the nature and volume of the points that I'll be addressing. So, part of the time I will be reading copy, part of the time I won't. So, if you appreciate what the Obrey Project does, please feel free to send a tip or donation via links found in the description. If you have an idea you'd like me to give a voice to in an episode of Briefs, leave it in the comments or send it in an email, or better yet, send a donation with the idea tagged onto it. If I'm unable to treat the subject, I'll return your donation and state why I cannot field the topic. Other than that, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. And now, Mandela James Version. Now, the source of this is from a YouTube channel entitled Song of the Bride. And it comes by way of a lady by the name of Dolly Weber. The claim in general, though the claim and the points are not specific only to Dolly Weber. These are claims that I've heard from many different sources or outlets or people. And the claim is that the Mandela Effect or something has literally changed the Bible in a very paranatural or supernatural way. So, brief history, the Mandela Effect is a theory, and, and in a way like the theory of there are no forests on flat earth, it piggyback atop other topics or other media outlets typically espousing different topics than this. This was never usually the main topic of any given channel or, or media outlet. Its name is based on an incident many swear that they remember, and that incident is Nelson Mandela being reported as dead in the 80s, even with uh, an accompanying funeral service and subsequent riots. I still haven't seen evidence of these reports of his death or the funeral service or, or the riots, but I would think there has to be a very good reason why there are so many people that remember this purported event, uh, therefore why they named this phenomenon specifically even though there are many different claims of various things being changed specifically, they named it the Mandela Effect. So, in very short time, the Mandela Effect caught on, in fact, much faster than many other topics, and soon nearly every YouTuber and internet writer was saying something about it. It has now become the subject of many large media outlets who treat it with really far more respect than most other conspiratorial style topics. There's even been at least one movie made with the Mandela Effect as the premise. In fact, it's entitled The Mandela Effect. And the odd thing is, most Mandela Effect examples have been in relation to pop culture objects, cereal boxes, movie titles, or book titles. All items easily forgotten or simply manipulated. But then it quickly spread to the Bible, the King James Version Bible in particular. And it seems that pretty much the KJV onlyest was the main target or source of sellable audiences. So this response of mine in this episode is going to be covered pretty much all of the topics that Miss Weber covered in her video, which will be, of course, linked in the description. So, point one is that New Testament names of prophets or characters have been changed. The claim is that these names, like Isaiah, Jeremy, Elias, Noah, with an E, N-O-E, 
have been altered. Miss Weber and others believe that at one time, these names actually appeared the same way that they do in the Old Testament. Isaiah spelt the same way as you would find in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, in the King James specifically, and the same goes for Jeremiah, Elijah instead of uh, Elias, and Noah, N-O-A-H, instead of N-O-E. Now, my counterpoint for this is one of the big issues with even even people who, let's say that, that Miss Weber genuinely remembers seeing those names in her King James Bible 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and they were not Isaiah for Isaiah, they were not Jeremy for Jeremiah. The thing about that is this, and a lot of people don't really recognize or teach this, but for one thing, the King James Bible has actually gone through four revisions since the AV 1611. This is why you, you can't really be a King James only person unless you subscribe to every letter, every dash stroke of the AV 1611, which I own a copy of. One of the problems is this. Almost anyone who would even make a video on the Mandela effect in the Bible is somebody who probably had one or more Bibles given to them, uh, either at a church they attended or uh, maybe a camp or seminar or function or something they attended. And this, from my point of view, this was actually one of the most economical ways to get a Bible because Bibles can cost a lot of money, depending. So a lot of us would just get Bibles, or especially if we were kids, we might attend a some sort of a Bible camp or something, we'll be given a Bible, and we'll actually keep that, use that for the remainder of our career at that church until we finally can break free from our parents and go away and not have to attend that church anymore. <laughs> now, that said kind of tongue-in-cheek, but that's that's really the way of it for a lot of people. The thing is, so the King James Version, it doesn't have any copyright on it, so any publisher can reproduce a King James Version Bible. It doesn't have to be perfect in every way for them to call it the King James Version Bible. And a lot of times they don't even specify what revision it may be. And as they revised those four different times, the most popular revision, a lot of people don't even realize that they they own and are reading this revision, is the 1769 revision. And that's besides the fact that a lot of publishers can take license with how they present the King James Bible. They would not have to tell you. If they produced a King James Bible and they decided to actually take those names which they thought were a little foreign feeling. In the New Testament, Esaias, Jeremy, Elias, Noah, N-O-E, and changed them back to the way that they tend to appear in the Old Testament books. So that's, that's really one thing to consider as far as people's memory of what they say, you know, once was. The problem is, again, I, I haven't seen any definitive proof that these people had these Bibles and they said one thing and then the Bible changed on them and it said another. This is a real problem is getting some kind of substantiable evidence. It's even, of course, the problem with the Mandela issue is there's no real evidence out there of it. It's simply a memory that a lot of people seem to have. Now, furthermore, so the difference in names, uh, such as demonstrated in the, it's in the difference between Greek and Hebrew, the difference between the way that these names are spelt and presented in the New Testament as opposed to the Old Testament. Keep in mind that the King James Bible, which was based off of a few older versions, uh, in existence. Now, this is as the story goes. 
This is not gospel truth. I'm telling you, as the story goes, as they claim, you know, there were already a few Bibles that existed that they actually pulled a lot from as far as their English form of and what manuscripts they decided to use. Really, the King James was more of a revision than a pure translation. You know, Matthew's Bible existed, Tyndale, the Bishop's Bible. The, the, these Bibles were already in existence, and they used these Bibles. And it really would have been more of a case of using what Bibles existed in English and then using, now this part is important, using a, a Masoretic manuscript uh, for comparison of the Old Testament and using a Koine Greek, well, actually, Erasmus, so he made a, a collation, a Koine Greek collation that they would have pulled from for reference of the New Testament portion. So the, the thing about that is, if these translators were trying to stay as faithful to what they were looking at in Bible translation, so if you want to believe that they believed that the Old Testament was written purely in Hebrew as a source language, Hebrew, Masoretic Hebrew, not, not Obery, Masoretic Hebrew, if you want to believe that they believed that, and if you want to believe that they believe that the New Testament was written purely in Koine Greek, then when they transliterated the names, because that's what they were supposed to do was transliterate the names, for the Old Testament portions, they would have transliterated the names slightly differently than the New Testament portions because of the dictations that those two different languages had on the way that those names were to be presented. There are so-called letters in Hebrew, so-called Hebrew, that don't even exist in Greek. There are four different letter sounds in Hebrew that don't exist in Greek. There is the, the so-called Zion, there's the so-called Sin, there's the so-called Sadi, there's the so-called Samic. All four of them have to be turned into the, the Koine Greek Sigma. So you see there's going to be a, a very sharp difference oftentimes between the way a name is transliterated in, in Hebrew, so-called Hebrew portions of the Bible, and Koine Greek portions of the Bible. So, even though in 1611 copies that exist, you can see that those names, are they're in there, as well as the many, and this is going to be a sticking point for all of these points, really, just about all of them, in the many commentaries that also exist, many of them also refer to that Koine Greek transliteration of Isaiah as Isaias or Jeremiah as Jeremy. Furthermore, if you go back and you look at the Septuagint, you can look at it in uh, uh, Bible software, or you can find versions of printed books that are any one of the, the three main manuscripts that the Septuagint was pulled from. You'll see that those names, if you get to the prophet Isaiah, you'll see that it is, in fact, instead of Isaiah, that it is Isaias, the same as what we would see when Isaiah is cited in New Testament transliterated from Koine Greek, um, because the Septuagint is also in Koine Greek. So I really think that that point is exceedingly weak, and I, I, would, I would really, really be hesitant to use that to try to make any kind of argument. Now, in addition, all we have to do is look around the New Testament a little bit to find many, many names that aren't the same as in the Old Testament. We can start with the first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew, and get to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 2 before we see a difference. The name of the patriarch Judah, as in Jacob's fourth son Judah, is transliterated in the KJV, the A authorized version, 1611, as Judas, like Judas Iscariot. That's the name, Judah. And if we go on to Matthew 1.3, it gets pretty insane, because nearly every name, in fact, I believe every name listed in Matthew 1.3 is different 
in the AV 1611 than it is in the New Testament book of Matthew in the AV 1611 than it is in that same AV 1611 if we go and reference it in the Old Testament. The first name Pharez, it becomes Pharez from Z to S, Pharez to Pharez. There's that sigma. So Zera, Z A R A H, in Matthew 1 3 becomes Zera, no H. Tamar from the Old Testament becomes Thamar with a T H in Matthew 1 3. Hezron, H E Z R O N, becomes Esram. So it's entirely different. And Ram from the Old Testament, the son of Hezron, becomes Aram in Matthew 1 3. And it, it's so prolific, folks, be, because of the difference between so-called Hebrew and so-called Greek. Because of that difference, I can do this, literally can do this all day with the variants in the way names are pronounced and spelt between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let me go on. Point two. She makes it from Luke 17.34. AV 1611. I tell you in that night, there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. Now she said it did not used to have men in that verse. And which she goes on to say, because apparently that having the men, the two men in one bed denotes homosexual behavior. My counterpoint to this is again, whether or not there was men or not in that verse, subjective memory, you're going to find a number of Bible commentaries that say two men in one bed. Some might think it has to do with homosexuality. Some won't, because there can be a lot of reasons why two men might be in the same bed. Those two men might be a father and son who are sleeping in the same bed because they're poor and they only have one bed in the house. It could be two men having to share a bed in an inn where there's no extra rooms and there's one bed and they have to both sleep in that bed. Nothing homosexual will say about that. And the th you know, the thing is, to say that that's an issue also is reading into this portion of Luke, reading into the portion of Luke that she's referring to, Luke chapter 17, as though Jesus is referring to a rapture event. So just reading that interpretation into this passage can cause further problems with whether or not men was in that passage as she or others remembers it. And then she goes on to say, plus the next verse, Luke 17, 35 removes the word grain. So what you have is two women grinding together, and then the one is taken and the other is left. Now, if you reference that back over to Matthew, in the KJV 1611, it says two women grinding at the mill. It simply doesn't say that in Luke. And look, I'm going to tell you something right now. Whatever it is, I can't imagine that grinding in the sense of, of how Miss Weber is interpreting grinding ever even existed as a euphemism at the time this was done. So uh, I think that's pretty much over the top. So now here's the big one. This has probably occupied more space in my notes than any other, and it's Isaiah 11.6. It is a passage that names a number of animals, and based on just about every English translation we have today, it would appear to be creating a, a, a type of symbolism with these two animals that were typically predator-prey, uh, no longer being predator-prey. And um, she and a lot of people out there, this is like the number one point used they say that it used to read, the lion and the lamb shall lie down together, as opposed to the wolf and the lamb. The problem with that, by the way, lion does 
Well, Ari, and it's translated to lion, it does also occur in the verse with calf or cattle, which technically is is what lions would tend to hunt more as big game, but I guess that can be considered a little bit irrelevant. The thing is, once more, this would require the change to all of hundreds of commentaries also. Commentaries that are often very detailed and say, Wolf, I checked all of these before I even did this. Every single point she made, I would check to see if there were commentaries using that language. And in every single case, there was always commentaries. So if this is some kind of glitch in the matrix or changes that the devil made or whatever else the case is, they would have to have changed all those commentaries too, just for, for some explicable reason to make lion and lamb to be wolf and lamb. And I can't think of any good reason to do that. Also, it would require the changing of, it has to be at least hundreds of paintings that exist, by the way, that has the imagery of that verse, because it's a popular verse. People have known about that for a long time. There are many, 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 many paintings that exist from over a century ago, is their date, that have that very imagery of wolf and lamb. Now, a, a number of people, including Dolly Weber, provide video clips from a while ago of different characters like John Hagee, and like there's one out there of John MacArthur saying lion and lamb. She provides one of Martin Luther King saying lion and lamb. Now, they probably simply made an error because they weren't reading directly from that passage. And that was the case in virtually every single video clip I saw. They weren't directly reading from that passage in Isaiah 11.6 and affirming that it was the AV 1611 that they were reading from. Now, that's a problem. She actually goes on to say that the devil made that change, and those who say it was Wolf are delusional. Uh, but the problem is likely it is less likely delusion on the part of those like myself who remember Wolf and Lamb as correct being delusional, but perhaps the problem is one, lack of solid memorization on the part of most concerning Isaiah 11.6, and two, the fact that lion and lamb imagery is a predominant feature in specifically New Testament theology regarding Jesus' nature roles. She also says that Jesus always, according to her, Jesus always called Satan's servants wolves. And I would say, yes, therefore, the wolf is a perfect contrast to the lamb, as these two New Testament verses even affirm, the first being John 10, 12. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scatter the sheep. See the contrast. It's a perfect contrast between wolf and sheep. The second is Acts 20:29. 20, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter into you, not sparing the flock. So you see, even in light of all of the lion and lamb imagery that we have specifically from New Testament theology, the contrast between wolf and lamb is far stronger if we look at the passages in context. And of course, she goes on to claim that Christians who have used the KJV for decades have apparently affirmed this. And the problem is that anyone who would affirm that is essentially expecting others to put more faith in their memory than many other more objective clues. And if, you know, if their pastors, personalities, or these Mandela people professing this as fact, many people will then question their own recollection. So if somebody with influence keeps repeating the wrong thing, you're going to get that in your head and you're going to be influenced by it. I mean you and I mean me. It happens to all of us. And this is a real problem. Influence. 
and if somebody with influence can affect your belief. And that's exactly the case, especially when we're talking about pastors doing it, teachers doing it, parents doing it. So that's really, I think there's just overwhelming proof, one, that it was always wolf and lamb, like I said, through paintings, commentaries, and I have clips, I went out and found clips, pretty old clips, of preachers going through verse by verse the Bible, the King James AV 1611, because these were a, these were King James only people like Arnold Murray, for instance, who specifically read that verse as wolf and lamb. So we have a problem. If they can provide video clips, old video clips of people saying lion and lamb, I can provide video clips of specifically people reading from the text of the AV 1611, and I know a few things about Arnold Murray, and I can tell you he wasn't accidentally reading from a revision. He would have been reading from the AV 1611, and he specifically says wolf and lamb. So, from there, I'm going to move on to Miss Weber's point number four. So, point four regards Strong's H539 which is translated as nursing fathers. She and others claim that that's a corruption, that this is actually Satan promoting transgenderism. Now, the two passages in question I'm going to read and then expound on. The first is Numbers 11:12. Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou should say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father, beareth the suckling child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers. And the second is Isaiah 49, 23. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face towards the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. Now, my response to this is, first, I would ask if this critic believes nursing bottles didn't exist at this time. Breast pumps aren't even difficult to make with household items. It's entirely unreasonable to believe that the KJV translators did not live in a culture wherein this was possible or done as well. Now, over and above that, it is again a supreme error due to lack of knowledge to trust the KJV as being translated in anyone other than the translator's lords being J James the first, not Jesus, best interests. Further, the word used is Amen. That's H539, and is translated as nurse or nursing only four times of its reported 110 appearances. Typically, it appears as believe, sure, or establish. And it's used in context as one's affirmation, such as we see in the New Testament's Amen. Its translation here in, uh, in Numbers 11, 12, and in the verse we saw in Isaiah as nursing father, works only because the idea of min, the root, being typically used as source, and the ah denoting self, they suggest very much something near to nursing, at least in a, a metaphorical sense. Note the far more prevalent word yinak, H3243, is to be found in Isaiah, the same verse, regarding the queens or princesses. And it's entirely reasonable. If the male and female are both regarded as giving sustenance in the way of suckling, however, I would point more towards an issue in the entire KJV, that it's rife with these translational inconsistencies, many of which are found in passages even the Mandela Effect proponent remembers well 
yet has not been, as they would claim, changed. And what I mean is, for instance, Genesis 12, 2, in which Yahweh is, is said to have said to Abraham, in the KJV 1611, he said to say to Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation. And, and while the word goy, G-U-Y-H 1471, occurs about 266 times as nation, it also occurs 143 times as heathen. Why wouldn't Satan, if this is Satan as Miss Weber and others have frequently suggested that is making these alterations, and some say, well, he's making the alterations because God is allowing him to make these alterations, but either way, if it was Satan and it was malicious making these alterations, why wouldn't he alter passages like that to read, and I will make of thee a great heathen? And it seems like a lost opportunity to me. So now, point five. She claims that incorrect grammar or vulgar speech has been inserted. Now, the two passages in question are passages that contain the word piss. The first is Isaiah 36, 12. But Rabshakeh said, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men that sit upon the wall, they that may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? And the second is 2 Kings 18, 27. But Rabshakeh said unto them, and this is a parallel verse, Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? I mean, nearly word for word, if not absolutely word for word. So she's got a problem with the word piss. <laughs> She's, she's big into, she doesn't like cussy face. Now, my counterpoint here is, again, here's the thing. Many commentaries would also need to be changed if it originally said urine or some such sort, and the devil or whomever changed it to piss, such as John Gill. And John Gill is said to have been writing his commentary in the late 1700s. And he writes, the Jews have substituted other words in the margin instead of those in the text as more cleanly and less offensive. For dung, they put excrement. And for piss, they read the waters of the feet. <laughs> and I don't know how that, <laughs> I don't know how the waters of the feet is more descriptive than piss. Everybody knows what piss is. If I saw the waters of the feet, I would be so confused. I would think that that's like, I would think the waters of the feet would be like on the day when I thought it was going to be really cold, so I put on wool socks, and then it wasn't as cold, and so my feet got so soaked with my own sweat. But anyways, so Gil goes on to say, and had we in our version put excrement and urine instead of these words, it would have been more decent. So it seems that Gill was just as uptight about the dung and piss as Dolly Weber. But the thing is, why would Satan change urine to piss, then insert a complaint about the word piss in John Gill's commentary? That doesn't make any sense at all. Furthermore, why would anyone be shocked if the head of Sennacherib's army used blunt words like piss or even shit. He was very stern in what he was telling men on the wall. If you read the account, he's talking to the king's emissary very loud and in the obery or so-called Hebrew language. He's not using Aramee or so-called Aramaic. He's speaking loudly and he's speaking in the language of the soldiers for a reason, because he's trying to instill fear and dread in the hearts of those soldiers. Anybody who's been around soldiers know that these people speak very plainly and very vulgarly, just as a matter of course. But um, 
if we're going to get hung up on cuss words, you know, that, yeah, I too personally just hate when people ruin a perfectly good bloody conflict with cuss words. Now, point six. Point six is a real, a real interesting one. Dolly and, and others insist <laughs> that emojis have been inserted. <laughs> emojis or smiley faces. Now, a smiley face can be made on a modern keyboard by typing a colon followed by a closed parentheses. And if your keyboard is coded or the software in which you're writing, like say an internet browser, would change that to a smiley face. And they'll change a semicolon and a closed parentheses to a winky smiley face. You know how it goes. So she shows a number of examples from various verses. I tracked down these verses in the authorized King James 1611. The problem is that those closed parentheses aren't even there. In the authorized 1611 I have, all you have is colons, no closed parentheses. So that entire argument of Dolly and anybody else who, who tries to uh, assert that is to this day patently false. So on that point, she really should have double checked that with a print copy of the AV1611. Point seven. I, I love this one since this is one of my specialties, but she claims that no such thing as corn existed in that part of the world, yet many words are translated as corn. Now, indeed, it is true. 14, that is one, four, 14 different so-called Hebrew words are translated as corn, making a total of 91 occurrences of corn in the current 39 book canon of just the Old Testament. That's not counting the number of occurrences of corn that could be in the New Testament. See, and I remember corn being there from the earliest times, from the earliest Bible readings or preachings, corn being there from my childhood, as do the commentaries include, again, corn. A lot. Plenty of. And the thing is, in addition, the Freemasons, see, they use the symbolism of a number of verses that mentioned the corn, the wine, and the oil from the Old Testament, and have for a very long time in their in their artwork symbolism, in their own uh, speeches uh, that they give at dedication ceremonies, and in Freemasonic literature. So the thing is, all of that would have to be changed as well. Now she presents a document by a guy who goes by the name of Rich Deem, D E E M who asks, how is this possible that corn should appear in the KJV Bible when corn wasn't even in the Middle East until introduced? <laughs> and I can't believe he makes this point. It wasn't even in the Middle East at, at all until it was introduced from the Americas. <laughs> Now, if you're me and you're familiar with my work, you'd understand why that's so bizarrely funny. <laughs> right, indeed. Indeed. Well, it's a good point. Strong point. <laughs> so, the thing is, though, the Bible mentions many grains as a staple in these people's diets, the diets of their beasts, their grazing ruminant animals. It is uncommon to the Middle East. He's, abs he's absolutely right. All of these grains, not just corn, wheat, barley, they're all uncommon to the Middle East. The problem is in the Middle East, in Egypt and in Palestine and neighboring countries, the bumper crops that you're going to get there are typically citrus, with both Palestine and Egypt 
receiving high amounts of grain imports specifically from the U.S. and elsewhere. And this isn't for lack of trying. It's for lack of being a proper environment for crops like grains, which were the most plentiful crops mentioned throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And you bet, that's a problem. But I don't think it's a problem of any sort of supernatural change that's ever taken place. I would imagine a great number of the people listening to this video can remember corn being mentioned from the earliest times in their KJV Bibles, from preachers, so on and so forth. Now her next point, point number eight, is, and I'm, I just don't even know where these points are coming from, as though they were valid of some kind of... The problem is as though they were valid in some sort of a, uh, a, a very intelligent, malicious scheme. You know, some of these points are just so weak. But point number eight, she claims that wineskin, she clearly remembers wineskin in her KJV Bible replaced with bottle. And I'll tell you, there's only a few entries where this word bottle is used. I don't particularly remember whether it was wineskin or bottle from, from young ages. But here's the thing. Many other translations actually do use wineskin as opposed to bottle. And now this is very interesting and instructive since most of the English, if not all of the English translations we actually have, uh, are direct results uh, of using the King James translation, just like the King James translation would have used, you know, the bishops, Matthew, Tyndale. But here's the thing. Now, a lot might use wineskin because it sounds maybe more poetic, but I think actually a lot of them use wineskin instead of bottle because it more supports the narrative of us being amazingly primitive until just like, you know, mid to late 1700s and especially 1800s. That's the reason I believe more translations after the King James changed it back to wineskin. The thing about this is it harkens back to assumptions that glass blowing wasn't already a skill and a profession at the time, which I would absolutely think it was. It also probably makes more people think of a very backwater sort of situation, which is what most of the culture shapers want us to sort of see the Bible through, this, this lens of a primitive culture. These passages or expressions where it's, it's expressing the fermenting of wine or fermenting wine being put into bottles as being a bad idea as they could burst the cork or crack the bottle, if it were a glass bottle. That is the, the problem with putting fermenting wine into a glass bottle, because it will bust the cork or the bottle. If you put fermenting wine into a glass bottle, the issue is if you put fermenting wine into a skin, that skin will still stretch to a point the glass bottle will not. The glass bottle will likely burst either the cork or its carcass. So the thing is, if you check these passages, you'll see that words that are translated as new and old in these passages, they're not always the words most commonly used for new, like new covenant. A different word is used than the words used for new in verses that are describing this whole situation with so-called new wine and so-called old wineskins. We have to look a little bit at what's the reality of making wine and bottling wine. You make wine in one sort of receptacle wherein you can, let, you can take off the pressure of the off-gassing that is caused during fermentation. Then once all of that is mostly run its course, then you can put it into a bottle. And this is precisely what I believe the Koine Greek is more aptly describing than a situation where we're looking at something like putting wine that's actually fermenting into these old wineskins, which would 
that would be the only situation in where there was a problem. Not if you put wine that was thoroughly fermented into an old wineskin or an old bottle. That would be perfectly fine. It's the fermentation process, and because of that, it should suggest an entirely different situation, and therefore an entirely different euphemism. So I think again on this point, Miss Weber and others have gotten it really wrong. Now, the last point, I, while I couldn't believe a few of these points, honestly, were even in here, and not only used by Dolly Weber, but many people, she claims that the word naughty used to be worthless, wicked, or ungodly, and that naughty is, <laughs> naughty is just a silly word. <laughs> and it would never have been in the original authorized 1611. She doesn't remember naughty. So I guess somehow because it's a silly word that Satan would have wanted to change a more appropriate word into a more silly word like naughty. And here's the thing. Naughty does uh, appear three times in the AV 1611. All three of those occurrences are being translated from different words. The first word being Belial, strong H 1100. The next being Ewe, strong's H 1942, the last being Roa, Strong's H 7451. Now, I'm going to have to say in a very sarcastic way that I would imagine that Belial, which is actually a transliteration of the first word, and it, it actually occurs a number of times as Belial or Belial, is actually somehow clearer in Miss Weber's mind than naughty. And the problem, for instance, with all the times that it is transliterated as Belial, is Belial or Belial doesn't actually carry any meaning with it. I think I would, I would much rather prefer, in casual reading, to see naughty than Belial or Belial. And the point, again, to most of these arguments that that are being made by people who claim this is why? Why? What's the motive? What's the, 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 the end here? To be honest with you, I think maybe Dolly and others are watching far too much Monty Python, and that's why they think naughty is a silly word. The, the thing is, naughty is actually comprised of the root naught, which is defined by most dictionaries as either nothing or an evil act. And the suffix y is typically used for the office of or characterized by. So given the other uses of these words, to write a word like naughty, knowing that it's characterized by evil or a worthless act, it's entirely appropriate. It's not silly, it's not weird, it's not out of place. So, I don't know what else to say. Except, let's give the devil his due, and at least suppose he wanted everyone who read those three entries of naughty to become immediately silly, to do silly things, to walk in silly ways, and maybe even make silly videos. One can never underestimate the brutal machinations of the Lord of Darkness. In conclusion, I'm going to read a quote from the Sunday Times. It reads, Harvard neuroscientist Steve Ramirez says in a post on his website that when storing memories in the mind, human beings also store details such as smell, mood, and even sounds associated with those memories in the part of the brain called the hippocampus. This brain machinery, according to Ramirez, is not only responsible for this, but it also reconstructs the past. The brain also uses the hippocampus to imagine our future selves. Because of this, Ramirez says memories were hardly ever 100% 
accurate as the brain constantly modifies them with bits of information. So like for instance, this is me talking, if somebody titled something Interview with the Vampire and you heard or read that title and the wording of it was a little bit sticky. It didn't really roll off the tongue. Interview with the Vampire. You might in your brain, the hippocampus, might just naturally change that title when you roll it through your brain as interview with a vampire because it just rolls right off the tongue. Back to the article. So big is the Mandela effect. There is now a movie named after the phenomenon, which I mentioned earlier. A teaser trailer is already out and the film will premiere on December 6th. Now this is being written in 2019. The Mandela effect tells the story of a father who suffers intense grief after the sudden death of his daughter. While mourning her, he has bizarre visions leading to a realization that the Mandela effect isn't just real, but that parallel realities and existence are too. Now that is from an author with a very difficult to pronounce name, Sebalil Bengu, the article being hundreds remember in quotes, Nelson Mandela dying in the 1980s inside the Mandela effect, closed quote. And that's from the Sunday Times' Times Live, November 2019. Now here's my wrap. In other words, regarding the article, our memories are faulty. My memory is faulty. Your memory is faulty. However, here's where I believe the gaslighting takes effect. Is our collective memory faulty? If a great many people remember anything in a way that differs from what we have on record, then I believe it is worth finding out why that is. The establishment, while they play the side shown above, i.e. memory is faulty, also have been pushing multiverse theories and entertainment for a very long time, specifically for such a purpose as this. So if one asks what's the purpose of random disconnected events like this, the answer is the purpose is specifically to gaslight a large percentage of people and perhaps use these social media outlets as a tool for logging the identity of people who watch, like, or agree to seeing this as people who refuse to admit that their memory may be faulty and insist on what they saw. What, after all, do you think the great, as in extensive, asylum system of the 1800s was really for? Was it to treat and care for those who were truly sick in the mind? Or was it one to imprison those who insisted in opposition to all new official propaganda that, for instance, buildings, bridges, towers, statues, and infrastructure existed long before the new lies were printed and forced upon the children, and two, to perform experiments to see if these memories really could be wiped from a mind. Experiments such as seen in the film version of 1984, i.e. torture, perhaps shock treatment, perhaps lobotomy. Seeing everything that I've seen, I conclude this introduction of the Mandela Effect, as well as many multiverse theories, is a conditioning for many changes to our understanding, <laughs> our very limited understanding of the world, history, ethnology, and reality in general. 
In 1984, the Ministry of Truth that Winston Smith worked for would simply destroy all materials relating to a subject and recreate the old archived materials while destroying all that existed of the original stories. The only thing 1984 was lacking was the idea of a multiverse and Mandela effect, which in the hands of a government like Big Brother could have been very beneficial. This is one reason I can't even believe that there isn't an amazing hue and cry from the alternative or stolen history community regarding how, for instance, the U.S. government has sold this huge, massive amount of, of documentary film footage of so many historical things and projects and information to a private company called Periscope Film. They literally sold all of this historic material that tax dollars paid for to a private company who now, since they own it, since they own the copyright to it, can edit it, reproduce it, and limit the use of it to anyone and in any way they want. I can't even believe that out of all of the so-called truthers out there, no one has raised a great stink over this thing being done in our faces through outlets specifically like Periscope Film. Now the thing is, even though a number of these points I don't think are very good or serious points. I take the Mandela effect very seriously, but just absolutely not in the way of supernatural alteration of the Bible, especially in such weak and arbitrary ways. And of course, oftentimes I have to believe that a lot of these weak and arbitrary and ridiculous arguments are being made deliberately. The Mandela Effect is a serious problem. See, if most of the people actually awake and aware begin to believe there is no objective way to determine a thing's truthfulness and objectivity, if we lose all grasp of any plausible epistemology, we're then truly at the mercy of those who simply say, for instance, Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. Another 1984 reference. The thing is, if we truly start believing that there's no way for us to exercise any epistemology, i.e. epistemology, a system of being able to determine what is true and what is real, that is a problem if we all begin believing that there's really no epistemology in existence for us to pursue. We truly are at the mercy of those who just decide what words mean, what is a fact, what isn't a fact. For anyone who has seen the movie 1984, and if you haven't, you should, there is a scene where O'Brien, he repeatedly holds up while Winston is being tortured. On, on some sort of rack. He keeps holding up his fingers and telling Winston to tell him that he's holding up a different number of fingers than what Winston really sees in reality. O'Brien gives him a different number and he tells him, I'm telling you this is how many fingers I'm holding up. It's a different number than the number he's holding up and he expects Winston to tell him the number he told him, not the real number what he ex is seeing in reality. But the number that Big Brother is telling him to see, that's the problem with us getting to the point of a multiverse, a Mandela effect, to a point where we don't have an epistemology. We can't possibly have the tools or the knowledge or the understanding can't possibly exist 
for us to get to the heart of matters of truth. This is the whole reason for establishing and developing the Obery Project. Obery as a language, as an a priori, self-evident language. And that, that, of course, in my opinion, is the reason for changing, for altering so many languages and for using the bastard language that we use today, English, as the world's lingua franca. It's because it is a meaningless language. They can change it in whatever way they want, however they want. I simply believe that the Mandela effect, like all of these pop culture multiverse references, really just contributes to our increasing sense of maybe we can't know anything as objective fact, as objective reality, things that can't be changed, things that have to be forever remaining the same as truth. This is my, this is my very, very serious problem with it. It's, in my mind, it's a truly a very chilling thought. So, therefore, I would caution everyone who would consider the Mandela effect as possible to be very careful about what you buy into and always ask, what purpose would this serve and whose ends does it ultimately satisfy? Imagine for a moment a multiverse where fruit, F-R-O-O-T, was changed to fruit, F-R-U-I-T, in Fruit Loops, but where Kellogg's, the maker of, is still the same cereal baron. Do you understand the, the, the strangeness, the statistical improbabilities of these things? They focus very much on things that, again, in my opinion, are actually not that difficult to change or to alter. They're gaslighting us with things like the Mandela effect. Or imagine, imagine a multiverse or a Mandela effect in which maybe Satan changes godless to naughty <laughs> instead of maybe the, the much more effective change of righteousness to godless, which apparently he never thought to do. These Mandela Effect claims, they don't really add up. And to be honest with you, the, the only one out of all of them that, that I'm actually quite willing to hear more on, I, I would like to see uh, more people look into this phenomenon, specifically the phenomenon that this is named after that so many people really believe they saw or heard stories of Nelson Mandela dying in prison in the 1980s with a subsequent funeral and riots. That is something that I believe was very possibly part of a gaslighting campaign which would see its payoff many years later. But. I'm going to wrap up this episode of Briefs. Thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time.